1 Corinthians 13, we're going to start in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. And here's what we're going to talk about today. It is not irritable. Circle it, underline it, highlight it. It is not irritable or resentful. So we are in a culture that encourages irritation. We're in a culture where if you're having a bad day or you feel irritated, our culture encourages you to vomit out into the world whatever is in your heart. And it takes the fo many forms, and one of the many forms it takes is going online. Face, snap, chat, Twitter, land. And you go to your media of choice, and you go, you know what? Today's a bad day. Hashtag stinks. And I'll tell you what happened to me today. I got up, and my dog got into my MAC makeup and dragged it all over the carpet. And then I went to go put my clothes on, and my daughter had taken my dress that I was going to wear. And then I walked outside, and then the car, you know, I got in my car, and there was the, the radio station presets had all been changed. And so I had to find my radio station. And then I got back on the freeway, and then everybody on the 15 didn't want me with them. And so it was just really, I couldn't merge, and blah, 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 blah. And so you finally get done with your exasperating story and everybody jumps on with you. Gosh, you get that's a hard day. Do you, you know what? You deserve to be angry with all these. Your, your daughter shouldn't have taken that dress and blah, 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 blah. And so everybody kind of emotes with you about how bad your day is. Because when we do those things, we're looking for other people to validate the fact that, you know, my day's pretty bad, right? And we're looking for people to go, you're right. Wow. I don't even know if anybody can handle a day as bad as yours. You deserve to be irritable. I mean, all those things that you just said adds up to irritability. You, you're just, it's, 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 it's beyond your control not to just be irritated and agitated. So, I've just finished preaching through Ephesians, which was heavy-duty theology. And so now this Go and Be series is going to be the application of the things that we learned. And so while many of us have Bible knowledge, we're like, I know the Bible pretty well, I've been around the Bible, blah, 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 but it's amazing how we can have a lot of Bible knowledge, but not a lot of Bible practice. Amen. So it's one thing to go, I know a lot of things, it's another thing to go, I practice a lot of things. So connect, this, this series is literally going to be the bridge between what you may or may not know scripturally and how to actually apply that. Because it does you no good to have knowledge without practice. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the heavy lifting on practice in this series as we go and be Jesus in every context. And we're going to start off with one, a sermon that you probably never heard in your whole entire life. And it's going to, I'm going to walk right into your home today. And for many of you, right into your life and confront an issue that you may have never even thought of. And it's this issue of why am I so irritable? Why, does, why is my heart always like I'm just waiting for somebody to set me off? I have a, my heart set, my foundational viewpoint is I'm having a bad day, things are going bad, things haven't gone my way, I'm having a bad life, hashtag bad. And so I have an excuse to act out. We live in a culture that encourages acting out because it's your truth. But the reason our culture would say that is how you feel is what's true for you. So if how you feel is what's true for you, then as you act out on your truth, then that's okay. Because you can't help it, because it's your truth. It's beyond your ability to deal with. The Bible actually speaks to the opposite of that. The Bible speaks to the fact of something that you may have never even heard of, much less practiced. So let's look at it. If you didn't get these notes, they're in the back back there. And the first is this question, or the statement. How I want to be irritable. How do I want to be? I want to be irritable. And so for those of you that 
that struggle in this area, or this is a weakness for you in this area, which is kind of everything's kind of negative. I'm kind of waiting for somebody to set me off so I can have an emotional release. And somebody can validate the fact that I, that I emotionally just went crazy or physically crazy. That idea that we kind of don't have a choice. Let's look at it. How, how I want to be? Irritable. Irritability is, an, is emotional and can have many sources. So look, I don't know how many of you guys are good sleepers. Anybody good sleepers in here? You're, fall, you're falling asleep as I speak or whatever? Like the minute, you know, my wife has the gift of sleep. So that's something I've always envied about my wife is she could literally tap out like right in the halfway through my sermon. She's like, I'm done, I'm out, you know, whatever. And so my, my wife has a, like the spiritual gift of being able to tap out wherever, whenever. I am not that way. I've always struggled with sleeping. I've always struggled to even fall asleep and stay asleep. I'm the kind of person that sleeps super light. And so if I hear crickets like talking to one another outside, I'll wake up and, you know, open the window. And, Everybody shut up. <laughs> so I can sleep. Like I got to have a perfect scenario uh, to sleep. Well, if you don't get good sleep, uh, we are designed for sleep. We're designed for rest. We're designed to decompress. We're designed to have our brains tap out. And our bodies tap out. God really designed us cyclically, that we, we cycle into sleeps so that we can recover. If you are not in that mode, if you haven't slept for days, if you haven't gotten good sleep, like many of you are yawning, then the reality is, is your brain doesn't work right, your emotions are all in flux, your body doesn't feel right. We're designed for certain cycles of sleep. So for many of us, sleep is an issue because we don't get good sleep or get to bed on time, 3 a.m. on the weekends or whatever. We screw up our sleep schedule, so we wake up going, I am totally a zombie today. And here's what happens, is you have an emotional, you have an emotional cushion, and things eat away at that. Lack of sleep. Maybe some of you are, uh, are on drugs. So it might be drugs given to you by your doctor. So pharmaceuticals, we live in a culture of pharmaceuticals, right? You can get almost whatever you want by complaining about some need in your life. And so somebody will rip you a prescription, and it could be legitimate, could be illegitimate. But many of us live in prescription drug land, and it affects how we interact, because it's literally affecting the chemicals in our body. So that can produce irritability, whether it's lack of sleep, or the pharmaceuticals were taken, or maybe it could be street drugs, where it's whatever, pot or methamphetamines, or whatever it is. Like if you're addicted to something, you change, over time, drugs have to play a part in changing you because it's literally morphing the way your, the chemicals work in your body and even the way your brain functions. And if it affects the way you think, then it'll affect the way you act. So eventually, at some point, there are things in our lives, whether legitimate or illegitimate, that affect our irritability. And it, it eats away at this cushion in our lives until finally, emotionally, we're just metal on metal. And we have no ability to absorb bad circumstances that walk into our lives. And here's the issue. All those things can be true, but is it possible that I can live a different life than the one my culture tells me is okay to live if it's not okay with God? It's okay to be irritable. Man, you got a lot of bad things that have happened. It's okay to live in, 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 in this irritation of your heart. Because here's the way it plays out. Listen. Everything that you do at some point emanates from your heart as far as a volitional action. So if you live on, in constant irritation, just you're simmering just below the water, and it's, there's, that, there's that moment where something sets you off, something on the freeway, um, the, a Prius driver in the fast lane, something that is really <laughs> irritating. And you realize... Why am I getting so irritated about this? Well, it's because it's, irritation starts in a heart of selfishness because things are not going your way or things have not gone your way in the past. And so watch, you make an excuse for how you feel based on circumstances in your life. And our culture would say, I totally understand. That's totally legitimate. Do whatever you need to do. So irritability, watch, a heart of irritability from that heart comes anger. Why are you in this lane? <laughs> to rage. Hey, pull over right now. You're only going 61, so it won't take long. <laughs> 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 
to violence. You get out of your car, and he gets out of his car, <laughs> and there's a fist fight on the side of the, of the 15 freeway. And you go, hang on, let's rewind this moment. Do you know that road rage is almost exclusively an American phenomenon? Not that it doesn't happen other places, it does, but the idea that we get so angry at perceived slights to a stranger we don't even know, that's not even, that's not even directly offending us for the most part, that we get so enraged we pull over and get into life-threatening fist fights over somebody not using their directional BMW drivers or, anyone, or anything else that happens, <laughs> right? We, we, it builds up into like, I, I literally am gonna crack this guy's skull. Over what? Because you, you personally took offense to something that's not illegal, immoral, unethical, or unbiblical? You're gonna go to war over something like that? Road rage is almost exclusively American. I don't know how many of you guys have driven in Paris or been in, in Europe. Dude, that's crazy talk. You watch the way they drive in their little like clown cars or whatever. They're driving around in, in, you know, in Paris or whatever. You would think that's gotta be the road rage capital of the world. People are driving on sidewalks, inside cafes. I mean, it's just crazy, but no. So the issue isn't, can I make sense of this? The issue is, why isn't it my way? Why aren't you acting the way I want you to do? Why aren't you out of this lane? Because you're disrespecting me. So watch, if you have a heart of irritation first, irritation leads to anger, which leads to rage, uncontrolled action, which leads to violence. That's, that's, that, that's the format it takes. So if you are a rager, if you're like, I'm just waiting for somebody to set me off, somebody's gonna get cracked. It's gonna be my wife, it's gonna be my kids, it's gonna be somebody on the freeway. If that's you, understand that doesn't come from a heart of God. That comes from a basis of selfishness that goes, things aren't my way, you're not acting the way I want to, and I need to fix this. Shortness of emotional control can produce anger, rage, and violence. And here's a principle. Anger can be appropriate, but shouldn't arise from irritation. Amen. So watch this. This might surprise you. It's maybe something you've never heard. Anger can be righteous. Anger is not sinful. Anger in and of itself is a, an emotional state that seeks to correct something that's wrong. But it's either what God thinks is wrong or what we think is wrong. Buckle up. Here we go, angry people. Righteous anger says, I need to stop this. I, I need to physically go fix this. Let me give you an example. Somebody molesting your wife or your kid. You don't stand back and go, oh, I, hope something, I hope somebody does something. No, you step into that situation. If you, have to, if you have to physically stop somebody, you do that. Literally, if you have to kill somebody. Our, our penal code says he was justified in killing that guy because this was happening, this thing was happening. And if anger drives you to that, if it's righteous, it's okay, even in our legal system. But unrighteous anger is this, it's not my way, so I need to fix this so you do what I want you to do. So selfishness says you need to change. Righteous anger says God cares about this and he's using me as an agent to fix this situation. Everybody see a difference in anger? anger? Anger that's godly is an action that God cares about. Anger that's selfish is what I care about, and that's where violence and problems happen. You go to jail or end up dead. When you act on an irritation inside your heart that ends up becoming a selfish motivation. The result of irritation becomes sinful when it affects our behavior or creates needless negative issues with others. So look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 5 that I read. When I said that love is not irritable, that is the Greek word, because New Testament is written in Greek. That's the Greek word that means to make sharp or provoke. It's like if you're, if you're emotionally, if you're like a bear that's just waiting for somebody to poke it so you can just go nuts. Like if you're just that bear that's just like, oh man, somebody do it, somebody do it. Somebody give me an excuse to go nuts. 
so that when people go, hey, why'd you go so crazy and beat that guy or break into that store or to hurt that person or say that harmful thing online and you slandered somebody and they haven't even done anything to you but they irritated you somehow. Why did you do that? You're able to say because X, Y, Z happened rather than saying I'm not gonna do that because God gives me control of my emotions. We allow other things to give us excuses to do ungodly things. That's coming from a heart of irritation, not a heart of godliness. <coughs> Irritability can expose selfishness that at other times might be hidden. Ready? Here's how you know you're, here's where you walk into being irritated. If something is delayed, denied, or disrupted. You wanna know how your selfishness is affected? Let me get ready, everybody walk with me. I'm gonna walk right into your house. I'm gonna get in the car with you as we go on the 15, here we go. Watch, here's how your selfishness and my selfishness is exposed. We have a plan. I'm gonna get on the 15 at 9.07 and I know I'll make it to San Diego airport at X. And at about 11 or whatever, right? You, you plan things out. Things don't go as planned. The car doesn't start. The kids go crazy. Uh, somebody on the freeway does something to you. They flip you off, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, watch, watch now, your whole plan is, has been disrupted or delayed or in some cases denied. You instantly, the way you react to those things tells you where your heart is at because your plans got, got messed up. And instantly, how you deal with that is a, is a representation of, of where your heart's at with God. Because when everything goes your way, everything's fine. But watch, you can have a wicked heart, and when everything goes your way, you look like you're a godly person. But the reason God puts things that d delay, deny, or disrupt our lives, the reason those things happen, you get a cancer report. Your kids go to jail. Um, you don't make that plane that you need to get on. The reason, the reason God does that isn't because he hates you. The reason he does that is to teach you that number one, your plan is not always the best plan. And number two, when, when your plans get, get disrupted, it shows you, it exposes your heart. And you never know those things until your plans get jacked up. I'm going to live to 85 and I'm going to see my grandkids, grandkids. It's going to be awesome. And I put all this 401k money in there and all of a sudden you get cancer at, you know, 52 and you might not make it another three years. And you know what happens then? You have a choice either to be angry and bitter and God, you didn't give me my full life and I'm going to spend my last whole years just hating you. Or you can say, God brought this into my life for some reason. I don't know what it is. I want to be humble and helpful with whatever time I've got left, whether it's 50 years or five minutes. The reaction's up to you. Because God stepped into your life and said, I'm going to change your plans. He might, he might do a miracle and, and, and wipe cancer out of your life and give you the next 50 years. But again, he might not. The issue isn't, are things going to go bad? The issue is when things go bad, how do we respond? If you're coming from a heart of irritability, you're going to go right to anger, to rage, to violence. If you're coming from a heart of God, it's different. And that's what we look at next. So here's the principle, ready? There are no bad days. Get this, ready? This is a cop out, you've been told a lie. I'm having a bad day. Here's the thing, there are no such thing as a bad day. Bad days don't exist. Everybody has the same day. But you know what the difference is? The difference is how you respond to, bad, to, to unwelcome circumstances in a day. Ready? There are no bad days, just bad reactions to unwelcome circumstances. So don't, don't ever look at your life as, I'm having a bad day. Because even inside of a day, there can be great moments and unwelcome moments. So whether you get a cancer thing and you lose your job, at the end of the day, you're going to go, I had a horrible day. In reality, you actually just had unwelcome circumstances, but now you get to decide how you're going to respond to those. There's no such thing as I'm having a bad day or I'm having a bad life. All there is is saying, unwelcome things have happened to me. How can I respond godly? Because there's going to be some days that are great. You're gonna, somebody's going to rip you a check and go, boom. Like the guys that just, I was just at the NFL draft in Nashville. Some, some guys there literally went from starving college student to a millionaire in half an hour. 
They went from like, I don't make any money because I'm coming out of college to all of a sudden walking across the stage, shaking Roger Goodell's hand, and they hand him a contract, and he literally went from zero to hero as they walked across that stage. They became millionaires literally overnight. So understand this. There's going to be days when everything goes great and, and circumstances are awesome. You have sex for the first time after you get married. <laughs> and it's awesome, right? It's like, this is great, fantastic. There's, there's going to be days when you make money and you're like, what a great day. And you buy a new car and you're like, what a great day. It still smells like leather or whatever, rather than a dirty diaper or whatever it's going to end up smelling like in a couple years. But understand, listen, understand, there are no bad days. There's just days given to you to decide how you're going to react to the circumstances that have happened that day. So don't just label something a bad day and go, I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, you can. You might not be able to do things about the circumstances, but you can always change how you react. So how do I want to be? Irritable. What does Jesus call me to practice? Here it is, peacefulness. What Jesus calls me to practice is peacefulness. In contrast to having a disposition of irritation, God wants believers to function from a place of peacefulness. The word peace in the Old Testament in your Bible is the Hebrew word shalom, which maybe you've heard of that. It carried with it the idea of completeness or wholeness within a person's life. This word conveyed a sense of harmony of relationship between people or prosperity of success or the victory over an enemy during war. Many times, shalom came through making a covenant between people or with God. So look at Isaiah 54.10. This is, this is what God in the Old Testament considers uh, the idea of shalom. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall never depart from you. So this is God speaking to Israel, the nation of Israel. And my covenant of shalom shall not be removed, says the God who has compassion on you. So it's the idea in the Old Testament, peace means wholeness, it means completeness, it means not being irritable, not being agitated, not waiting for somebody to blow you up so that you can make an excuse for going nuts. Peace says, I, I function from a space of peace rather than selfish irritation. Even if it comes from lack of sleep, even if it comes from other places, I don't allow the pressure of the other things to make me an irritable, angry person. In the New Testament, people are called to obtain peace through following Jesus and his will for their lives. While there may be exterior problems with others, listen, there can always be interior peace for the believer. And here you go. You want to know how to get peace? I'm going to show you. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. So in the Old Testament in Isaiah, it's God speaking to Israel in uh, John 14, this is Jesus as God speaking to believers. So this is literally me and you. Peace, shalom, I leave with you. My, here it is, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled or anxious or, or anxiety ridden. No, neither let them be afraid. Many times we function from an area of, I'm so scared of the future. What if I get sick? What if something happens to the kids? What if we lose our money? What if we lose our house? We spend so much time in irritation and agitation that we don't live for the glory of God. Because you only have so much emotional energy. And if you spend it on other stuff that may or may not happen, worry about the future, agitation, then actually you lose the reason that you're even alive. So what does God do? Because we all suffer from irritation. I was irritated a couple years ago one time. And so now, I'm helping others, right? No, all of us are irritated. All of us get irritated. All of us wake up and we go, this, we wake up with chronic pain. Or we, we wake up with, you know, we're still divorced. Or we've still been abused. And we wake up in this mental state of like, my life's bad. Or this is going to be a bad day. Let me encourage you with this. When you have Jesus in your heart, you can have peace. I don't have any hope for you if you don't have Jesus. I have, here's the thing, I love that video. How do you, where do you find peace? Oh, I, I, the trees, bro. <laughs> like, like these trees right here? Yeah, like the trees. Why do you, why do they, because they're kind of growing and blah, 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 whatever it says. Okay, so what if everybody cut down, what if all the trees in the world were cut down and burned? Now where are you finding peace? I, I, don't, I don't have peace, I thought. It was in the trees, and now all the trees are gone. Or that other guy, hey, where, where do you find peace? Oh, bro, man, sitting on my couch at home with the homies. They were smoking a bowl and eating these Cheetos and watching football. 
Okay, so what if you don't have pot, and what if the couch gets burned and all your friends bail on you? Then where are you finding peace? Uh, I don't know. Here's the, here's the point I'm making to you. You will never find peace in stuff. You will only find peace in a savior. If you don't find peace in Jesus, you literally will not find peace in this world, period. End of sentence. You need Jesus in your heart to give you peace. Peace can only come from, peace that lasts only comes from God. Every other kind of pseudo peace is just circumstantial peace. Hey, I got enough money today. Hey, I'm happy today. I feel good today, whatever. And, but that goes away the minute those things are affected. How can you have long lasting peace that goes past your irritation? is when you have Jesus in your heart. You repent of your sin, you come to know the God that loves you. He dwells inside of you, he gives you peace, whether you get a cancer statement, whether you lose your money, whether people don't like you online, people unfollow you, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, you can have peace, why? Because God is a God of peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And when he dwells in your heart, you can have peace. If you don't have Jesus, I, have, I don't have anything else for you. You need Jesus for peace. And here's the principle. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but rather the presence of Jesus in your heart. Having God in your life doesn't make all the circum bad circumstances go away, but guess what it does do? It helps you be a person of peace in bad circumstances. And this is going to hurt some of your feelings, but I'm going to do it, hopefully, to help you. Hey, people of peace find peace. People of fire find fire. When you return fire for fire, which is popular in our culture, you will always be burning. If you are going to continually go to war, listen to me, if you're going to continually go to war about everything that offends you online or with your friends or whatever, you will never have peace. People of peace find peace. People that are looking to be offended and wait for somebody to agitate them so they can go to war will always find war. We live in a culture right now that is we have a, a suicide epidemic about young people. And you know what the reason for that is? It isn't because they got enough technology or because the government isn't doing whatever they feel like, you know, we got like socialism. People are like, hey, just give everybody money. And if everybody has the same amount of money and we don't have to pay for school loans, then everything will be fine. I don't know who's gonna pay for it, but just give everybody some money. And guess what? They're looking for the government to bring them peace. They're looking for people to bring them peace rather than looking to the God that loves them to bring them peace. Because then it doesn't matter what the government does. Then it doesn't matter what my friends do or don't do. Then it doesn't matter what reports I get, because I can have peace. Why? Because God gives me peace. Godly, pe uh, godly peace is a stabilizing force in a believer's life, giving tranquility in times of turmoil and calm in times of chaos. Christians are called to be people of peace that do their best to be at peace with others regardless of their emotional state. So understand, here's the principle. God desires people to be at peace with himself, others, and within themselves. Listen to me. When you get up in the morning, I'm gonna be super practical. When you get up in the morning, here's the first thing that should go through your mind when, you, when, you, when your mind comes online maybe after your 12th cup of coffee, whenever it is, okay? Whenever, you're, whenever you come conscious, here's the, th the first thing that goes through your mind. Is Jesus helping me to be a person of peace today? Because you already know in your heart, in your mind, who the people of unpeace are in your, in your life. But listen, how you react to them says more about you than it says about them. People are gonna bring chaos into your life. People are gonna bring hurt but how you respond says more about you than it says about them. You have to be a person of peace regardless of who's in your life that's producing chaos or hate. If you return fire for fire, literally you just burn your own self. Stop that. Stop spending your energy hating people. Spend more of your energy loving Jesus. And you will find peace inside so that you can find peace outside. People of peace find peace. And people of peace are believers in Jesus because Jesus dwells inside. So here it is. How can I go and be this week? Ready? How can I go and be this week? So here's an emoji that may have, may have, uh, you may have used 
to um, describe your state previously. Do we have that one? Kyle, do we have that emoji? There it is. <laughs> you want to know something interesting? We are a texting society. Do you know you do more, if you're an average person, you do more connecting with people by text than you do even verbally or face-to-face? -face? It's the first time in history we, we connect with our thumbs. So watch. Do you know that emojis were created? They didn't even exist 15 years ago. No one had even known that you even had to have a picture to tell people what you're, what you're feeling. So in other words, when you text somebody, you ever got a text that had nothing on it like, hey, bro, you're lame. Uh, I'm lame? And it's from somebody you know, and you're like, you're trying to figure out, like, is that a joke, or you don't like me anymore, or what? And so you know what we did? We created emojis to go along with phrases to go, hey, LOL, just joking. Hey, just kidding. You're not really lame. I still love you. Or it comes along with something like this, like, you're lame. And you're like, oh, dude, are you, are, we, are you mad? Like, are we okay? I guess not. <laughs> and here's the thing. Here's a practical reality here, how you can go and be Jesus this week is the minute you come conscious, you say, Jesus, I want to be a person of peace. No matter what happens during this day, there are no bad days. There are just days. And it, it's up to me how I'm going to respond to the circumstances today. Maybe some will be great circumstances. Maybe some will be tragic. But I want to be a person of peace rather than just waiting for my, my irritated soul to have an opportunity to vomit. Take control of your thoughts. Your emotions are a result of how you think. It, it, can awesome pa it can oftentimes pass quickly through your brain, but as you think, you oftentimes feel. And you can't help how you feel, but you can help how you react. And how you react is a direct result of how you think. Take control of your thoughts. Don't think negative thoughts. Don't think disaster thoughts. Don't think this is going to be the worst day of my life or I'm having a bad life. Think, God, you have me in this day. You've given me another day. Help me to be a man or woman of peace to my husband, to my wife, to my kids that I want to throw in the street. Help me to love them. <laughs> Help me to love my parents. Help me to love my people on the 15. Help me to love Prius lovers in the fast lane. Help me to love everybody that's in my life. And here's, here's, if you really struggle in this area, let me help you with this. Here's super practical. The minute you feel your irritation, your agitation, getting provoked, the bears getting poked, I want you to pause and take a breath and count to 10. And by the time you get to nine and a half, give it to Jesus. So by the time you hit nine, you should be saying this, God, I want to kick my husband right in the face. I want to drive that person off the road. But instead, at nine, you go, you know what? Is this, an etern is this something that's going to matter in eternity? That the juice got spilled? Do I need to go ballistic over the trash not getting taken out? Do is this really an eternal justice issue? Nope. 99% of the time, it will not be. So in that moment, you say, God, give me the peace and the strength to deal with this correctly. Help me love my, help me love my husband. Help me love my wife. Help me love my children. Help me love my parents. Help me love the people on the 15. No, please, you first. <laughs> and guess what? When you practice peace, you will sense peace. If you practice fire and hate, that's exactly what it will be in your heart. Here's the question you need to ask yourself over every time you want to do this. Ready? Does God feel the same way as me, and will this matter in eternity? There's your question. Tattoo that to your forehead. That's literally the question that you can almost deal with at every aspect of your life. Does God care the same way I do about this situation? And if, if no, then you need to be a person of peace. If yes, then you might need to step in and correct it. Your children are rebelling against you. Something evil's happening. There's going to be times when anger's going to be appropriate, and you're going to need to discipline that situation or change it. But the vast majority of the time, if you're just agitated or irritated, take the peace of God to yourself, and through Jesus, you will have control over your actions because you can control your emotions.